Our next speaker, um, Deepa Rajan, and uh, without much ado, I'll invite her uh, to tell her about her title, etc. And we are running behind time, but never mind, we can stay 10 minutes late. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deepa Rajan, and today I'm going to talk to you about the tiny brains of hoverflies. But before I launch into this, I want all of you to consider a very basic, fundamental question. What is a flower? If an alien came down to Earth, an alien who had never seen a flower before, and asked you to describe one to him or her, how would you describe a flower? How would, you de how would you describe how it looks, how it smells? What sort of descriptors would you use? Maybe you'll talk about the colors, but flowers have all different kinds of colors. Maybe you would try to define a flower by shape, but look at this diversity of shapes. And maybe you might try size, but we have big flowers and small flowers. And you might even try odor, but there's such diversity in the odors of flowers because they all have different chemicals. So we're back to the conundrum. What exactly is a flower? There seems to be no universal identifier of a flower, and it's really hard to describe a flower to a creature who has never seen a flower before. So this question that is so hard for me to answer is actually crucial. It's a life or death question for the hoverfly to answer. So hoverflies are generalist pollinators. You've probably seen them around, but confuse them for wasps or bees because they're excellent mimics. So generalist pollinators mean that these insects don't just go specifically to a rose or specifically to a daisy or any specific type of plant. They try to, and they try to identify a flower, any type of flower. And they are very cosmopolitan, so they exist on all of the continents except for Antarctica. And because they're so cosmopolitan, they have to navigate vastly different ecosystems and environments. So obviously the landscapes in India are gonna be very different from the ones in North America, and they have to navigate these new landscapes, and at each step of the way, they have to ask themselves, what is a flower? And this is life or death, because if they don't know what a flower is, they can't eat, and they'll die. So another important point is that these are solitary creatures. So unlike many bees, which live in hives and, and learn from each other, these hoverflies don't talk to each other, they don't learn. So they have to learn by themselves, they have to know by themselves what a flower is. So the great challenge is the moment that an adult hoverfly emerges into the world for the first time, they've never seen a flower before. They don't have anyone to teach it what a flower is, and yet they need to find a flower and figure out what a flower is if they are going to survive. So um, the species I worked with for my uh, project are these two, the Aristilus tenax and Aristolinus aeneus. And there are thousands of species of hoverflies, but I chose these mainly for ease of availability and the, the wealth of literature on them. So my first question was, what is the sensory template of a flower to a hoverfly? More specifically, what are the minimal cues required to create an object that the hoverfly thinks is a flower? And to answer this question, I did a choice assay developed by my colleague in the lab, Aditi Mishra. So basically I'm trying to find out what the sensory skeleton of a flower is. When the adult fly emerges into the world, it needs to have some innate idea of a flower is because it has no other way of finding its first meal. So in this choice assay, it's a very simple test. So this is a cage right here. And on either side of the cage, there is a different object, and you can vary visual cues and odor cues. And this is a very simple 3D model of a flower. And you can see there's a little strip of filter paper underneath where I load the, the odor. I use a pipette and I load the odor. Then I release the fly into this choice chamber, and I allow it to make a choice. It'll fly to one flower or the other. It'll land on one or the other. And therefore, I can, I can gauge its innate attraction to one, innate preference of one over the other. So based on this, I've parsed out the important cues for a hoverfly to identify a flower. We found that the presence of odor is important. 
So if on one side of the cage there's a model with an attractive floral blend with lots of chemicals from different flowers, and on the other end there's a model with no odor, then the fly will go to the one with odor. Um, but then we ask, what's the type, is the type of odor important? So then on one side we have a floral odor, and on the other side we have the green leaf volatile, which is basically the smell of cut grass when you're mowing the lawn. And strangely, they actually don't have a preference between these. Then um, we tried a fruit odor, a banana odor, and again, strangely, they did not have a preference between the floral odor and the banana odor. So at first, this confused us because these are pollinators. We thought we'll go for the floral odor. But actually, maybe it's helpful for the hoverfly to just identify any sort of plant, which can be identified by the, the stem, the leaves, the fruit, the flower, because in the vicinity, there might be a meal, because nectar is located on many different parts of the plant, not just the flower. We also found that the presence of visual cues is important. So if we have a flower model and a gray disc, a yellow flower model, the hoverfly will go towards the yellow flower model. Color is also important. If you have a yellow flower versus a blue flower, uh, most of the times the fly will go to the yellow flower. So what does this tell us? Basically, this has allowed us to parse out what are the important odor cues and visual cues that are staples for a native attraction when a hoverfly is trying to figure out what a flower is. So now that we've established an innately attractive flower model, here's the next question. What is the mutability of innate attraction? So if hoverflies are born with a certain idea of what a flower is, can the sensory template of a flower be changed? So basically, can I brainwash these, flower, these flies into thinking that something else is a flower, or what they think is a flower is actually not a flower. So first, we'll build up on what the actual innate attraction is. So based on the literature, um, Aristotle's 10x hoverflies have a strong innate attraction to the color yellow. They extend their proboscis, which is their tongue, to yellow spots, yellow pollen, and out of this huge array of colors, they land on the color yellow. And one way to assess innate attraction is with the proboscis extension reflex. So this right here is the proboscis, and it's the tongue of the hoverfly, and the hoverfly uses it to search for food and to suck up food. And the proboscis extension reflex is basically a food searching behavior. So previous research done by a scientist named Klaus Lenau suggests that the innate preference of this hoverfly species so the color yellow cannot be changed. So he did an interesting experiment in which he put quinine, which is a very bitter substance, on a yellow dot. And he put rewarding sugar solution on a blue dot. And he tried to train the flies to go to the blue dot instead of the yellow dot. And despite all of the punishment the flies were receiving by receiving quinine on the yellow dot, they still extended their proboscis to the yellow dot and not the blue dot, even the blue dot has the sugar solution. But this research did not really make sense to me, ecologically. First of all, dots of paint are not the same as flowers. Second of all, if hoverflies really cannot learn, then how are they existing in the wild? How do they learn to avoid toxic flowers? How do they go to the rewarding flowers? So I really was not convinced with this research. So that led me to an enigmatic flower called Neil Kringi, or Strobilanthus kumpianus. So many of you might have heard of this flower. It's, it blooms once every 12 years, and there was actually a mass blooming expected from July to October 2018. And I first heard about this when I arrived in India in late August, early September for my Fulbright. And I was very excited to hear that I was here when this is happening. So you might remember from the previous graphs that the hoverflies are innately attracted to yellow, but don't really seem to be attracted to blue. So what happens if their entire environment is flooded with blue? And this is a blue flower that undergoes mass blooming, so entire hillsides and mountains are covered with, with these blue flowers. I'll give you an analogy. So my least favorite food happens to be igli. Some of you might have tried it. So given a choice, I will not choose to eat igli, but 
If I'm trapped in a room and I have plates and plates of idli all around me and that's the only thing I have to eat, well, I am going to eat idli. I'd rather eat idli than starve to death. So I think about that situation when I look at these hoverflies because maybe they're surrounded by their least favorite food, but I would like to think that they're smart enough to actually recognize that there's a reward associated with these blue flowers. So then off I went to Chikmagalur, Karnataka to look at the relationship between the hoverflies and the Nila Karinchi flower. This is what I expected to see. Hillsides covered with flowers. This is not what I saw. <laughs> This is what I actually saw. It's really beautiful, but where did all of the flowers go? I, um, I searched for days on foot and by car through these mountains, and I could not find the flowers. The locals were confused as well because they had seen them before, 12 years prior, but not this season. They thought it might have something to do with a hotter climate and habitat loss. There were other locations in India where the Nila Karinji was blooming, in Munara, Kerala actually, but I couldn't come because of the flooding. And in Uti, um, in Tamil Nadu, they were also blooming, but I couldn't go because when my Fulbright started, the flowers had already started dying. So it's back to the drawing board. What is the mutability of innate attraction, and how can I change this sensory template? So this time, instead of going to the field, I went to the lab. And I developed this learning assay. My goal was to train these hoverflies to not extend their proboscis to an object that is innately attractive. So they think something's a flower, and then can I extinguish what their idea of a flower is? And what I did is every time um, these flies landed on this attractive flower, the yellow artificial flower model I showed you, I punished them by giving them quinine. This is a, a fly exhibiting innate proboscis extension to the yellow flower model. So there's no reward on this flower. There's no sugar or anything. It just is innately attracted to the visual cue, the, the flower shape and color, and the odor cue. And it thinks that there's food. And this is a naive fly. So this fly has just emerged into the world, has never seen a flower before. And yet it still thinks it has some innate idea of what a flower is. And I'll show you a, a close-up video of this as well. This is in slow motion. So you can see the, the proboscis, the tongue really extending. She's looking for food. She thinks it's hidden somewhere. So then here comes the punishment part. So here I'm putting drops of quinine solution on top of the flower model. Here comes the fly. Flies can actually taste with their legs. So the moment the leg touches a quinine drop, she really doesn't like it. She flies away. Here she comes again. Touches the quinine with her leg, she doesn't like it. So I keep doing this over and over until this fly, so now this flower has nothing on it. The fly comes onto the flower model and it just sits there. It doesn't extend its proboscis at all. So what I've, I've found is that hoverflies can learn to become unattracted to something that they are innately attracted to. And I use these data to, con to construct a learning curve, and I found that within 20 such trials with quinine, about 90% of the flies learn to not think that the innately attractive flower model is actually attractive. And amazingly, these alterations to innate attraction are persistent over time. And some of these flies remember after almost 100 hours after their training. So what we've done here is altered a, a hoverfly's innate concept of a flower. So it used to be this, 
but not anymore. So, so again, we've constructed a model of a flower that's pretty minimal using visual and odor cues, and we've altered the innate attraction, and we found that this is persisting. So in the future, I want to see if I can actually turn something else into a flower. So this is no longer a flower. But then, can I make a rock a flower? Like a pencil? I mean, I'm just being facetious, but can I change another object to, into, into a flower for a hoverfly. And I also want to learn about the neural underpinnings of this phenomenon. What is the brain chemistry that changes when these flies learn and change their innate preferences? So we're back to our initial question. What is a flower? And actually, it's a hard question to answer because reality is a construction of the brain through which it's processed. And the sunflower might be a flower to you and me, but this artificial 3D printed flower might be a flower to a hoverfly. And this project really extends beyond the tiny world of hoverflies and cute little plastic models. I really hope to shed light on the varied nature of reality, how it differs from creature to creature. So the next time you stop to smell the roses, I hope that you will not take the ability to do so for granted. With that, I'd like to thank my wonderful advisor, Dr. Shannon Olson, and my colleagues in the lab, Aditi Mishra and Veena, who've helped me immensely with my experiments. Thank you very much. <laughs>